Hello everyone. Tonight, I'm going to retell you one of the greatest science fiction stories of the 20th century. Foundation by Isaac Asimov. To begin with, please find a comfortable position. Relax and get ready for a long journey far into the future, so far that the memory of Earth has faded away and men now live in the entire galaxy. Our story begins in the year 12067 GE, GE for Galactic Era. This era had begun when the Galactic Empire had been proclaimed across the galaxy. And since then, for 12,000 years, the Empire had guaranteed peace and stability to mankind. The Empire was so vast that few of its subjects could even conceive it. It comprised 25 million inhabited planets, where thousands of billions of humans lived. On worlds so far apart that each person barely knew a handful of planets among the millions the human race had colonized. What had made the Empire possible in the first place was the discovery of hyperspace travel faster than light travel that allowed planets several thousand light years apart to stay in contact and to belong to the same political entity. The Galactic Empire had been proclaimed by Franken I 12,000 years earlier, 12,000 years before the starting point of our story. And since then, Despite changes in dynasties at its head and ongoing progress in technology, the Empire had remained for so long that it had become synonymous with civilization and humankind. Maybe the Empire had been so resilient, so persistent, because it did not only depend on one ruler, the Empire was also a system. Behind it were aristocratic families that controlled many planets and ensured, generation after generation, that the state remained unchallenged, that it didn't lose its grip on the galaxy. And this system was so strong, so efficient, at generating adhesion and respect that it had lasted for thousands of years already. And it was common sense that it would last for many more millennia. Or was it? On the capital planet of the Empire, Trantor, a worrisome prediction had been made. Trantor was near the center of the galaxy, and it was certainly the only planet known to everyone across the Empire. Trantor had been urbanized for thousands of years, and was now home to 45 billion inhabitants, who lived in a single gigantic city that covered the entire planet. Except for the Imperial Palace, the planet was covered with domes that provided a perfectly stable and predictable climate. And to house such a large population, the planet city had different levels, one above the other, where one could spend an entire life without ever seeing natural light. On Trantor, most people worked either for the Empire's administration, or in its industry, or in food production, 
in the countless yeast and algae farms that existed across the many stories. The nutrients they produced were processed, flavored, colored, to turn them into a palatable food. But Trantor was so populated that it also relied on other planets to ensure its needs were met, its needs of foods and goods, and its population was prone to revolting, which forced the emperors and their administration to keep it satisfied at any time. The most brilliant minds of the galaxy were drawn to Trantor, its universities and its library, the Galactic Library, said to contain all human knowledge. One of these minds belonged to Harry Seldon, the psychologist and mathematician, and he was the one who had made this prediction that now had the Commission of Public Safety on Trantor worried. Seldon had developed a new field of science, a new discipline, psychohistory. A discipline that used mathematics to predict the future. Not the future of individuals, this would have been too random and chaotic, but the future of large societies, and his models predicted that the empire was on an unavoidable slope of decline that would ultimately lead to its fall. And no individual action, no corrective measure, no deliberate change of course could possibly avoid that. The fall was unavoidable because it was already too late and the momentum could not be reversed. Such was the gloomy prediction of Seldon and psychohistory. According to Seldon, the signs of this decay were already visible. Technical progress was continuing, but at a slower and slower pace. Trantor was hit by revolts, and even though they were always kept in check, and no one could seriously fear that they would threaten the imperial institutions, the inability of successive emperors to restore a quiet and harmonious society was obvious. The capital, Trantor, may also have been more fragile than it seemed. The planet had not been self-sufficient for centuries and needed to be fed by other worlds, making it more vulnerable. And far from Drantor, in the margins, the periphery of the galaxy, more and more planets slipped out of imperial control, because the empire was too big, too centered on Drantor, too complacent. And after thousands of years of existence, it now lacked the drive to reassert itself. Based on the prediction of psychohistory, Seldon believed that the Empire would collapse in about 300 years, after which a long period, a dark age of 30,000 years would follow. An age during which the rule of law would disappear, science and knowledge would recede and humankind would lose much of the prosperity it had enjoyed for thousands of years. With a young mathematician called Gail Dornick, Harry Seldon had checked and rechecked the models. However gloomy their predictions were, there was no room for error in his view. The empire was doomed and in a matter of generations, it would be gone. Both mathematicians, Seldon and Dornick, were arrested for spreading such nonsense. 
the empire had been strong for thousands of years. It was unchallenged across the galaxy. But its elite was also well aware that the empire's main asset was people's faith in it. Their belief that it was the natural order of things and that it would always be there. These were crucial to the empire's stability and longevity. Seldon's predictions were dangerous because they could erode faith in the empire and become a self-fulfilling prophecy. He had to be silenced, all the more that he had gained followers who had embraced psychohistory. So it was decided that Seldon would be tried for treason. The trial was an opportunity to discredit him, but also a risk, the risk to give him a chance to explain and defend his views, and he did. He explained during the trial that his predictions did not derive from any hidden intentions or animosity toward the empire, but from cold calculations and the certainty that numbers and science could not lie, could not be wrong. He also argued that there was not a single path to the future. The fall of the empire was a given in about 300 years. It was now too late to stop it from happening. But what would happen after was not yet completely defined. On its actual course, the future looked particularly grim. A new empire would rise one day, but only after this dark age of 30,000 years. However, there was a way to reduce this dark age dramatically to only a thousand years. For this better future to materialize, humanity would have to create a compendium of all human knowledge, away from Trantor, a galactic encyclopedia that would safeguard mankind's intellectual legacy and help it restore civilization and stability much faster. The Commission of Public Safety on Trantor that had accused Seldon weighed its options. Executing Seldon was tempting, but also risky. What if his theory survived him because he had followers, and his death created a, a martyr that would only reinforce the movement he had initiated? It was considered better politics and better optics for the Empire to exile him instead, and even let him create this encyclopedia with the followers who would want to go with him. This would help get rid of Seldon and his most loyal followers at once, and also without looking too harsh which would be seen as a sign of weakness. But he would have to be exiled very far from Trantor, as far as possible, which hopefully would make the memory of his theory fade away and fall into irrelevance. It was decided that Seldon would have to go to Terminus, a remote planet at the outer limits of the galaxy. Terminus was the farthest away planet from Trantor. It orbited an isolated star and lacked resources like metals, even though its climate made it habitable. And it consisted of vast oceans dotted with small islands the closest inhabited planet to it was Anacreon, 26 light years away from Terminus, the perfect place to send dissidents into exile. 
that Seldon already knew all this. He received his sentence with satisfaction, because it was just what he had anticipated. Terminus was an ideal place, far away from the galactic center and the chaos that would follow the Empire's collapse, to safeguard humanity's knowledge and plant the seeds of a new civilization. Because Seldon's plan was not just to create an encyclopedia, it was to found the core of a new empire that would one day replace the decaying one that still reigned over much of the galaxy. This was what this institute, this foundation he wanted to create on Terminus, was really about. The encyclopedists that would voluntarily accompany Seldon to Terminus received an imperial decree acknowledging their actions, and a hundred thousand of Seldon's followers embarked on ships that would take them to Terminus to establish the foundation. Fifty years passed. The colonists had arrived on Terminus and established a large city, Terminus City, on one of the islands. Fifty years after the trial of Harry Seldon, the Empire was still around, and Trantor was wealthier and more populated than ever. But on its margins, the Empire was increasingly challenged. It showed signs of disaggregation. More and more planets declared independence from it. And because it didn't have the uh, energy to enforce its rule everywhere, because its authority was slowly decaying, the Empire seemed to be on a path of decadence that was more obvious each day. But it was still gigantic, its fleets were by far the most powerful of the galaxy, and its grip on the most important planets was still real. On Terminus, the colonists had built their city and worked on their task, their reason to be, the Encyclopedia. Terminus City was modern, technologically advanced, and theoretically protected by the Empire, which it nominally belonged to. But the Empire's decay was very visible in this remote sector of the galaxy. The four closest worlds, including the planet Anacreon, the closest to Terminus, had declared independence from the Empire, and they had cut relations with Trantor. These four planets called themselves the Four Kingdoms, and among them Anacreon was the biggest military power, and it had expansionist views. Terminus and the Foundation had little to offer, nothing really, in terms of resources, and the population on Terminus was scarce. But the Foundation had one thing. It had knowledge, advanced technology, especially nuclear devices, that none of the four kingdoms had. And this made Terminus a possible prey to its bigger, better armed neighbors. Anacreon was actually pressuring the Foundation to establish a military base on Terminus. And this was obviously a move motivated by the desire to control the Foundation's technology. Political affairs in Terminus City were handled by its mayor, Salvor Hardin. But in reality, power was in the hands of the Board of Trustees of the Galactic Encyclopedia a group of prominent scientists. 
Hardin was highly worried by the attempts of Anacreon to take control of Terminus and hijack its knowledge and technology to its benefit. But the board of encyclopedists was not interested in developing an active diplomacy, arguing that the foundation was protected by imperial decree, so the empire would come to their rescue if needed and that its goal was the creation of the encyclopedia, not to become a political or military power. Hardin saw this position as naive. If Terminus did not react, they would be annexed sooner or later. The vision of Harry Seldon would get lost, and the Empire had no interest in defending this forgotten planet, to which disgraced scientists had emigrated 50 years prior. The dilemma was obvious, and every day more pressing, what to do? Stay neutral, at the risk of being swallowed by an imperialist power like Anacreon, or develop alliances and weapons at the risk of precipitating a war that otherwise could be avoided. Hardin was too pragmatic to accept this isolationist position of the board of encyclopedists, and he planned a coup on Terminus, a coup to remove the board from its powerful position. The operation was planned on the same day Harry Seldon would make a holographic appearance. Harry Seldon had died decades prior, but before he died, he had recorded messages for the future members of the Foundation. Based on the predictions of psychohistory, these messages to the future would help them navigate the crises and dilemmas they would encounter. The messages had been saved and would play on fixed dates. Nobody knew in advance what Harry Seldon would say. This virtual Harry Seldon, the ghost really, would deliver his speech on the same day as the coup which gave it even more intensity. What if Seldon's message turned out to be incompatible with Hardin's initiative to seize power? What if he declared that the Foundation's main goal was to work on the encyclopedia, even if it meant ignoring the rest of the world? The coup took place successfully. And when the hologram of Seldon made its appearance in the city's time vault, the place dedicated to these messages from the past about the future, it delivered surprising news to everyone. The recording of Seldon revealed that this whole encyclopedia idea was just a distraction, a pretext to allow the establishment of the Foundation on Terminus. The true purpose of the Foundation was not to safeguard knowledge, but to form the nucleus of a second galactic empire. This colony was the seed that would grow to the entire galaxy one day, in centuries and put an end to the Dark Age that would follow the fall of the current Empire. Was it the ultimate revelation of the Foundation's future, or another distraction to orientate it in the desired direction, like the Encyclopedia? Hard to tell. But what was certain is that the revelations made by the ghost of Seldon fully vindicated Hardin's actions to remove the board from its position of power. The Foundation was destined, in the words of its dead creator, to expand and defend itself, not to compile information. 
but the forces of Anacreon were now approaching. Terminus was almost defenseless. How would the Foundation survive this crisis? Salvor Hardin responded to the crisis situation with diplomacy. Out of the four kingdoms, Anacreon was the strongest and the most aggressive, but the three others were also there. So he visited each of them and explained that if they left Anacreon seize the Foundation's technology, this kingdom would become unstoppable and probably destroy or annex them. But it was not too late. They could stop Anacreon and create a balance of power by forming a coalition, a coalition strong enough to make the fourth kingdom back down. And so it was done. Anacreon had to renounce to establish a presence on Terminus, and a temporary balance of power was found. Thirty years passed, and it was now the year 80 F.E., Foundation Era. Thanks to its scientific advance, its edge, the Foundation had progressively gained a leverage over the Four Kingdoms. They relied on it for their spacecraft, their weapons, and plenty of devices that they could not produce themselves. Despite its small size, the Foundation had become the referee in this small corner of the galaxy, the entity that guaranteed a balance, an equilibrium between the four kingdoms and influenced them, not only with just technology. The Foundation had created an artificial religion called Scientism, very advanced technology looked like magic to those who could not understand it, and the Foundation used this. Instead of presenting its technological devices just as objects, advanced but mere objects, the Foundation presented them as holy artifacts and tools that only scientism could provide. The mass of the population in the Four Kingdoms was easy to impress with apparent miracles, in fact just artificial phenomena enabled by technology. And so the religion of scientism had spread to the worlds around Terminus. The priests of scientism, being technicians, who knew how to use technology, this religion, controlled by Terminus, gave it even more power over the Four Kingdoms, because the population's allegiance was not just to their political rulers, but also to scientism, whose center was on Terminus. But the secular elite, the rulers of the kingdoms, did not suppress this religion, because aligning with scientism also gave them control over their zealous subjects. Such was the politico-religious system that had emerged over the past 30 years and was now well in place in the year 80 of the Foundation era. In Terminus City, Salvor Hardin was still the mayor he had been re-elected continuously since uh, his success in the year 50, his political victory over the board and the elimination of the threat created by Anacreon. But he was aging and his influence was challenged by a new political movement, the Actionists. Thirty years earlier, Hardin was the one who advocated action against outside threats when Anacreon wanted to build a base on Terminus. Not anymore. 
he was now the defender of the status quo, or so it seemed. And the uh, actionists were the new hoax. They wanted direct action against the kingdoms that were growing increasingly aggressive and fearful of the foundation, especially against Anacreon, that had kept growing its arsenal and was now more powerful than the three other kingdoms combined. And the actionists were right about Anacreon's ambitions. Its ruler planned to overthrow the foundation by launching a direct assault on Terminus. To do so, the Anacreonians intended to use an old imperial battlecruiser, a massive space warship that had been redesigned and modernized by Foundation experts. Delivering technology to others was risky indeed. But what they all ignored was that Hardin had already ordered a few secret modifications to the ship's design before its delivery. The Anacreonian attack was prepared for the day of the coronation of a new king on Anacreon, which was advantageous for the attackers because Hardin would be on Anacreon this day as a guest to attend the ceremony. The plan was to arrest him so that the foundation would be beheaded right before the attack. But Hardin had seen it coming and he had too many years of experience to not have backup plans. He knew that the effective control of the Anacreonian elite over its people was far from guaranteed because scientism, the religion created by the Foundation, had a large following. The ambassador of the Foundation on Anacreon was also high priest of scientism. Unlike all high dignitaries of this religion, he knew that it was only science and technology in disguise. The ambassador followed Hardin's orders to foster a popular uprising against the local rulers on the grounds that they wanted to attack the holy city of Terminus and that this was blasphemous. A mob walked to the royal palace of Anacreon demanding the liberation of Hardin. And meanwhile, the modifications Hardin had ordered to the Anacreonian battleship revealed themselves. A remote kill switch had been installed and was activated, completely paralyzing the Anacreonian ship. The priest attendant of the ship, the representant of Foundation that ensured maintenance of a technology the Anacreonians did not understand, presented the failing of the ship's systems as a divine curse, a proof of the Foundation's holiness and God's powers. This made the crew mutiny against the officers, and the ship's commander was forced to broadcast a message to Anacreon in which he threatened to bomb the royal palace if the king was not arrested and tried. Power on Anacreon, that looked so well established the day before, but was in reality eroded by the religious influence and technical domination of the foundation, political power collapsed, masks fell, and the reality of true power appeared. The Foundation fully dominated Anacreon and the three other kingdoms. In the aftermath of this new crisis, the rival houses of the four kingdoms were dissolved and the Foundation took full control of them. 
On Terminus, Hardin's prestige was reinforced by this new victory, and by another message from the past, recorded by Harry Seldon. In the Time Vault, Seldon said that this crisis was always going to happen, and that it should end with the Foundation extending its control to the kingdoms. Salvor Hardin had once again been the instrument of it. On the fringe of the galaxy, the Foundation and its now multiple planets kept gaining strength as the Empire kept slowly decaying, even though it still controlled millions of planets. Fifty-five years passed, and the year 135 Foundation Era, F.E., arrived. All the colonists that once had accompanied Seldon in the journey from Trantor to Terminus had now died of old age long ago, and new generations had replaced them. Since the crisis of the year 80 F.E., the Foundation had completely absorbed the Four Kingdoms, and uh, since all threat in its vicinity had disappeared, it looked outward for expansion, still driven by uh, Harry Seldon's predictions that it would one day, after many generations, become the Second Galactic Empire. But a handful of planets in a forbidden sector of the galaxy was really not much yet, and the prospect of turning into a galactic empire still looked very remote. As in its past dealings with the Four Kingdoms, the Foundation had one main advantage, its technology, that kept being perfected. This meant that technological devices could be traded and trade could be a way of getting a foot in the door, of gaining more political and economic power. So the Foundation had sent out traders to neighboring planets, and one of them, Eskel Gorov, who was also an agent of the Foundation's government, had traveled to the worlds of Ascony. Ascony was a group of planets of the galactic periphery that had become independent, and in the revolution against the Empire, the Asconians had captured several ships of the Imperial Navy. They now used them for themselves. As in many other cases, the Empire had not had the means to retaliate and reconquer the planets which had remained independent since then. Ascani was ruled by a religious order, and this religion was harshly imposed on the population. A taboo banned advanced technology from this world. And so when the trader Eskel Gorov arrived, hoping to sell atomic devices, he was arrested and sentenced to death by the elders, the governors of Ascony. The Foundation sent requests for clemency to protect their own, but these requests were rejected. So the Foundation sent another trader, Limar Pognet, to try to negotiate in person with the elders. Pognette met with the Grand Master, the leader of the elders, and discovered that behind an appearance of rigor and virtue, the Grand Master may well be open to exchange the prisoner for a suitable bribe in gold. The appetite of the Asconians and especially the elders for gold, was insatiable. So Pognet needed gold to save Gorov and to defend the Foundation's interests. 
He discreetly fashioned a transmuter that would convert iron into gold. To the Asconians, who could not obtain gold in such quantities, this was nothing short of miraculous, and the Grand Master was able to impress the elders by using this gold for religious decorations, which pleased them. The origin of this gold, which was blasphemous because it came from high technology, was obviously not made public. In the shadow of the Grand Master was a counselor, a young and very ambitious man, who hoped to become Grand Master himself. Poniet saw him as distant at first, but after meeting with him, he realized that this counselor was actually willing to work with him, if it could help his own ambitions. The counselor believed that a steady supply of gold would dramatically increase his power and his influence. And Poniet sold him the transmuter. But with a catch, he planted a video recorder in it, and as soon as he could, he blackmailed the counselor with a recording of the transmuter's use. This meant death if revealed, and with this leverage, Poniet quickly obtained the release of Gorov, and for good measure, a large quantity of tin to take away. So the two traders, Poniet and Gorov, could leave the Asconian world safe and even wealthier. Technology from the Foundation had now been introduced and was there to stay. The counselor would most probably become Grand Master, and through him, the Foundation would be able to infiltrate Ascony even deeper with trade. Gorov was grateful for his liberation, but could not help but criticize Poniet's apparent lack of morality. In all the machinations that had taken place on Ascony, the blackmail, the secret meetings, the secret agreements with the counselor. To which Poniet replied with a, a cynical statement attributed to Hardin. Never let your sense of morals prevent you from doing what is right. Never let your sense of morals prevent you from doing what is right. Through all means at his disposal, every possible leverage, the Foundation kept expanding its influence. Twenty more years passed. As Poniet had predicted, Ascony had been infiltrated, some would say corrupted, by Foundation trade and technology. And like the four kingdoms before, it had fallen into the sphere of influence of the Foundation. Contact had been lost for decades with the Empire, which continued to shrink at an accelerated pace, losing planets faster and faster. However, the expansionist policies of the Foundation, via its religion of scientism and its trade of technology, that helped it infiltrate its neighbors, had now raised alarms. It was the case in particular with another neighbor, the Republic of Corel. Corel had forbidden Foundation missionaries to land under penalty of death, and this seemed to indicate that religious expansionism had reached its limits. Was scientism still efficient? when other states had understood it was a cover-up for imperialism. Corel was also suspected of developing technology by itself, or buying smuggled Foundation goods. Recently, three Foundation vessels had mysteriously vanished near Corel. 
The political class of the Foundation was increasingly worried that a nuclear war with Corel was approaching. For this reason, a mission to investigate was assigned to a trader, Hober Mallow, by the political authorities on Terminus, but with hidden intentions too, because as the Foundation had relied more and more on commerce in the past decades, its structure of power had shifted, had changed. The trader faction had gained power and influence within it. The nature of the Foundation as a colony, an institute, and a state had evolved constantly over the past century and a half. It was once dominated by encyclopedists, then the power had shifted to politicians like Salvor Hardin and religious leaders, and now it appeared to be on a path toward plutocracy, the domination of an elite of wealthy traders. So Hobermallo was chosen as the investigator sent to Corel because he was suspected by politicians of being connected to smugglers. Maybe his mission would reveal what was really happening on Corel, or would allow to expose him, or both. Corel was also plagued with intrigues, among which Mallow found its way and managed to establish commercial links. Investigating on Corel and another planet, Siwena, he understood that the Empire might be trying to re-expand in the periphery of the galaxy by equipping client states. The Corellians had imperial ships and different advanced weapons and machinery that they didn't know how to build themselves. And Mallow saw markings on these that indicated an imperial origin. But he also noticed that this imperial technology was not as advanced as the Foundation's. The Foundation had acquired an advantage that could be used to further its influence. Between the absolute rejection of the Foundation's religion by the Corellians and their need for technology, Mallow concluded that religion had reached the point where it could no longer make further conquests for the Foundation and became useless. But a commercial empire could. Trade could allow the Foundation to strip its targets of real power by making them become dependent on the goods the Foundation provided. And since the buyers did not understand how they were made, or how they worked, they would be unable to acquire this technology and compete with the Foundation. The following events proved him right. Returning to Terminus, Mallow was elected mayor and soon faced tensions with Corel, which went as far as declaring war on the Foundation. But Mallow knew that at this point, Corel had become dependent on Foundation technology. So instead of counter-attacking, he just imposed an embargo. Corel could not afford a long conflict and an end to the supply of advanced goods. And so its economy collapsed, and it was forced to surrender. The Foundation continued to expand and change with the political forces within it becoming weaker in the face of economic forces. But with this constant expansion and the travels of Mallow, the Empire was now reappearing, and however decadent it was, this was a much more formidable opponent, or friend maybe, for the Foundation. What would happen? 
And so ends the novel Foundation by Isaac Asimov. The story is not over, far from that. This novel is the first published of a trilogy. The second book is called Foundation and Empire, and the third, Second Foundation. These books are from the early 1950s. They are 70 years old already, even 80 if we consider that the story of Foundation I just told you was initially a collection of short stories published between 1942 and 1944, except the starting point with the presentation of Trantor, the Empire, and Psychohistory, which was added in 1951. In the 1980s, Asimov added more volumes to the trilogy, two sequels and two prequels, forming the Foundation series, that is, uh, collectively, a monument of science fiction. Why is that? Why is it important? First, because when it first appeared, Foundation was groundbreaking. Not the spaceships and the exploration of planets. These themes were already present in science fiction. But the scope, the complexity, the ambition of placing the story on a galactic scale and imagining a decaying galactic empire, this was really new. The first stories were inspired by the Roman Empire, and a work by an 18th century English historian and author, Edward Gibbon, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Asimov took it to space, but not as a backdrop to tell unrelated sci-fi stories. The focus of his books is the dynamics, the trends, through which a civilization might progress or decline. Foundation, and you probably understood it listening to this retelling I did before, is not about individuals and what they do, who they are. It is about the evolution of societies, the way they adapt, the interactions between forces in society, political, economic, religious. What makes a civilization successful or decaying? Of course there are characters and events happen because a story has to be told. But the characters do not matter that much. And they are actually not developed much with psychology or a backstory. More than anything, they correspond to functions. They are the agents through which much more relevant forces are at play. The forces of sociology, power dynamics, systems of belief, economic forces. If it were not them, others would have played their role, and events may have been slightly different, but the outcome at the level of the societies would have been similar. In that sense, this places foundation in a tradition, an approach of history, that rejects a history of great men, in which a few individuals, like kings, queens, generals, are the driving forces of human history. Different thinkers, from the Age of Enlightenment to Marx in the 19th century, have looked at history differently, as a continuum not driven only by individuals and events, but also, and maybe in priority, by ideas and social forces. Agree or disagree with this view, and also agree or disagree with the way Asimov describes the interactions between these forces, but that's the intellectually stimulating aspect of Foundation. It works in the first degree as a story, 
in which we are invited to root for the hero, but the true hero here is the foundation itself, an entity rather than a person. As one could root for Rome or ancient Egypt, reading the history of their rise. But what foundation truly is, is a transposition to space and into the future of the history of the rise and fall of human civilizations and the forces, the mechanisms that are at play at the level of an entire society or culture in these movements. The influence of foundation on science fiction and entertainment is major. From Star Trek to Star Wars, if you consider the political background in Star Wars, with the Republic, the evil empire, the rebellion, a story that spans several generations, this is really obvious. Even though Star Wars is in a sense an antithesis of foundation, it is a type of storytelling which is fully driven by characters, by individuals, heroes or villains, whose actions determine the destiny of multiple worlds. There are kinds of heroic characters in Foundation, like Harry Seldon, Salvor Hardin or Obermallow, in the sense that these people have remarkable qualities. But as I said, they correspond more to functions. They drive a history that needs to happen. In the logic of psychohistory, it doesn't really matter what individuals do, what decisions they take, what actions they start. They are just the agents through which much stronger, bigger social forces are at play. And these are the factors that will determine the future. Until very recently, there was no adaptation of Foundation in movies or TV series, and the work was always considered very hard to adapt. Not really for reasons of budget. It is a gigantic and complex world, but mainly for reasons of storytelling. How do you tell a story in which characters are not that relevant and societal forces are. It sounds complicated, because it could quickly turn into a kind of fictional documentary. This was tried with a show that keeps airing on uh, Apple TV, I think, which I am not going to uh, criticize harshly, because I watched it entirely. There are two seasons, and I was entertained all the way. It looks gorgeous. I liked what they did with uh, different characters. The acting is perfectly fine. And there are plenty of different storylines and uh, subplots I uh, really got into. So I would actually recommend this show, even though uh, I would recommend it even more if I hadn't seen the last episode of the second season, which I didn't like at all. To me, there were too many unnecessary plot twists and resurrections of characters that were supposed to be dead in a single episode, to be credible. I could rant a long time about coincidences that dangerously look like plot holes and create a kind of tension between a show that wants to be a bit brainy, and often is, but in which dumb things happen. But overall, I think this show takes you to a credible, colorful and rich world of exotic planets, futuristic technology, spacecrafts, adventure, which I found really entertaining. I may be easy to please when it comes to sci-fi, because when you give me spaceships, I'm already happy, but I liked it even though it does not really feel like the novels. The starting point does, and they reused the name of many characters. 
but what they are trying to do is a rather familiar kind of space opera, character driven, and in which they have to add cronings, cryo sleep sessions, or memory transfers so that the same main characters stick around despite the passing of decades. Whereas in Asimov's novels, the characters just die and are replaced by others. Now to uh, purists who want to be told exactly the same story, the one in the novels, this is not going to work. Because it's a different story and uh, a different angle. But I actually think the best parts of the show are things they added that are absent from the novels. For example, the uh, emperors, which in the series are clones. This was not the case in uh, Asimov's novels. And they form a so-called genetic dynasty, advised by uh, an immortal and mysterious robot that looks perfectly human. And with this idea comes a lot of interesting questions about the nature of these clones. Are they fully human? What kind of individuality do they have? What are their relations between them? Because at any given time there are three emperors, three clones at different ages, different stages of their development. The bottom line, to me, is that if you are willing to invest time in the first episodes to take in the exposition, this show is really worth a try. But if you want to discover and really understand Asimov's work, the only option remains to read the novels. This is all for tonight. You can now let go and fall asleep. I will be back soon with another story. And in the meantime, sleep well. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.